For those of you who don't know me, my name is James Wolfe and I'm Dean of the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome uh, each of you to this Rule of Law lecture. I'm very sorry to have to inform you that Joanna Cherry is unwell and is unable to join us. Uh, she sends her regrets and her best wishes. Uh, the faculty joins with the Bar Council of England and Wales in holding this event. In doing so, we reflect the particular role which our two bars play in our respective jurisdictions in upholding, promoting and defending uh, the rule of law. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome Amanda Pinto and James Hines who are here to represent the Bar Council. Uh, this event has been facilitated by Beyond Borders and I'm grateful to that organisation for its support. Uh, this building, Parliament House, is the seat of justice in Scotland. It has since the 16th century been the home of the Supreme Courts in Scotland and of the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, but this particular room, the Lake Hall, has another relevance for tonight's lecture. Uh, for the 17th century Privy Council, which met here, administered torture. Uh, I'm led to believe that it did so in what is now the Advocates' gown room through the double doors. <laughs> uh, and when the jurisdiction of the Star Chamber was abolished in England, the English authorities would transfer prisoners to Scotland so that the Scottish Privy Council might extract information from them. Uh, Lord Hope of Craighead relied on this history in the great case of A against the Home Secretary to point out that extraordinary rendition is not an invention of our own time. This then is an apt place to remind ourselves that the protection of fundamental rights is an intrinsic part of the rule of law as we understand it, and that the mechanisms by which we today protect fundamental rights within the three jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, as well as on the European and international plane, matter greatly. Our speaker, Dominic Grieve, is and has been a redoubtable, persistent, and principled advocate and defender of those propositions. Uh, Dominic has had a distinguished parliamentary career since he was elected as member for Beaconsfield in 1997. Before the 2010 election, he held a number of shadow front bench positions, including shadow Home Secretary and shadow Justice Secretary. Between 2010 and 2014, he served in the government as Attorney General, and many commentators regretted his departure from that office. He's currently chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee and of the all-party parliamentary group on the rule of law. Since Dominic left the government, he's reflected his commitment to the protection of fundamental rights and to the importance of the European Convention in a number of public speeches and interventions. And his personal contribution to the maintenance of the rule of law was reflected a few weeks ago in the award of the Halsbury Rule of Law Award. Uh, and I would just like to say, Dominic, how pleased I am, personally, that we found an opportunity for you to speak here, and I'm glad that it will be on a subject which you have made uh, very much your own. You set for yourself and for us an important question, and I, for one, look forward to hearing uh, your answer to it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, after Dominic Grieve has delivered his lecture, I will invite contributions, questions or comments from the floor. Uh, and we have refreshments available so that, even though it is a Monday evening, uh, if you're able to stay, we can continue the conversation after the form formal part of the proceedings uh, has ended. And now, Dominic, I invite you to give your rule of law lecture. Well, th thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have been invited here to deliver this talk today, and my thanks go to the faculty, the Bar Council, and, of course, to Beyond Borders uh, for having facilitated it. It's also, I, I might add, enabled me to combine a weekend visit to the Highlands, to Loch Arbor, uh, and to walk in the grey quarries and above Loch Ossian. So I, it couldn't have made me a happier man uh, as I came here today. And uh, also to see again so many friends uh, from a shared jur another jurisdiction whose influence is so important in developing our common jurisprudence. I also have to admit, it was only actually fairly recently that I became aware of all the work that Beyond Borders was doing. And of course, as is so often the case in our country, it brings together again lawyers practicing in different jurisdictions within uh, one, uh, one's country. 
which I think enables us to draw on so much enriching diversity. Now, perhaps rather predictably in view of what's happened to my career, the suggestion was made to me that I might talk about my views on the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act. As you'll be aware, the present government at Westminster is carrying out a review of the operation of the Human Rights Act and the ECHR. It was announced in the Queen's speech, trailed in a Conservative Party paper published just under a year ago, and of course repeated in the Conservative Party manifesto. In the year of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, in which the Prime Minister, I might add, played a leading role in its commemoration at Runnymede, the Conservative Party, my party, is mired in doubt about the benefits that both the ECHR and the Human Rights Act have delivered. The intention behind the Convention is lauded, but while it's described in the paper that the Conservatives produced as an entirely sensible statement of the principles which should underpin any democratic nation, the paper then goes on to assert that both the recent practices of the court and the domestic legislation passed by Labour, that's to say the Human Rights Act, has damaged the credibility of human rights at home. The paper accuses the Strasbourg court of mission creep. It outlines a programme of fundamental change, advocating the repeal of the Human Rights Act and its replacement by a new Bill of Rights that would, I quote, clarify rights, particularly under Articles 3 and 8, to prevent their abuse in respect of deportation cases, to confine the right to invoke a breach of human rights to cases that involve criminal law and the liberty of the individual, the right to property and other serious matters and providing a threshold to be set by Parliament below which Convention rights will not be engaged. It wants to limit the reach of human rights cases to the United Kingdom, removing the activities of the British Armed Forces from its scope. It also advocates breaking the link between British courts and the Strasbourg Court so that no account has to be taken in future of the rulings of that court. And the paper asserts a desire to negotiate a new status for the United Kingdom where the Strasbourg Court judgments are merely advisory and no longer an international legal obligation to implement. Or if this can't be achieved, leave the Convention entirely. And before it's thought that this is just entirely a quirk of my own party, it is noteworthy for me that some sections of the press are even more hostile to the Convention, actively campaign for our withdrawal from it without any prior negotiation in order to achieve any change at all. Furthermore, while other political parties have generally displayed greater enthusiasm for the Convention and for the Human Rights Act, this has often been muted when it's come into conflict with issues that might not be electorally popular. Thus, when Parliament at Westminster debated its response to the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in Hurst and Green and MT on prisoner voting, the silence from the Labour opposition front bench, and indeed the Scottish National Party at Westminster, and from the SNP government in Edinburgh, on whether or not the judgment should lead to Parliament changing our law to bring us into compliance with the decision of the Strasbourg Court, that silence was very noticeable. Just as indeed the fact that the previous Labour government succeeded when in office in procrastinating for five years so as to avoid having the issue properly addressed at all and handing it on as a poison chalice to its successor. So it was with these thoughts in mind that I felt it might be useful to concentrate principally this evening, not so much on the comp impact of the Convention domestically, but on its impact elsewhere. But if we are to set ourselves on a course of action that may lead to our withdrawal from the Convention, it seems to me important for us to assess what impact this might have on the way the Convention works for others. In understanding the working of the Convention, a good starting place is why it was created in the first place. We know that in the years after the end of the Second World War, there was a widespread and laudable drive to try and create international structures that might help ensure that its horrors were not repeated. It was this that led to Eleanor Roosevelt promoting the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Freedoms and to her describing it as the Magna Carta of the 20th century. 
It was in order to give the aspirations of the UN Charter some possibility of implementation in practice, rather than just leaving it as an abstract concept, that the member states of the newly formed Council of Europe created the European Convention and agreed between themselves by treaty that its terms would, if a challenge arose as to its interpretation, be adjudicated on by an international tribunal, the European Court of Human Rights. And they bound themselves under Article 46 to observe and implement its findings made against any of them in a particular case. Doubtless it's true that most Britons considered in 1950 that our common law tradition of liberties and our unwritten constitution, upheld by a democratic parliament, offered a better level of protection for freedom than any continental model. So in signing up to the convention, we were, I think, doing something new. We were intent at the risk of innovation, always a dangerous thing in the United Kingdom, through the creation of rights that we ourselves believe that we already enjoyed as liberties, not so much on protecting ourselves, but on setting a standard of behavior for states towards their citizens that could be universally applied. The 10 key rights in the convention, with the exception of Article 8 on the right to a private and family life, really are classic expositions of the liberties which successive generations of Britons have taken to be their birthright. But there are also clear differences of approach from our own tradition, as one might expect in a document whose principal movers come from diff very different national traditions. The British participants, led by David Maxwell Fife, look to establish a detailed list of clearly defined rights, whereas the French and some other nations preferred a general list of principles that would be left to the court to clarify by its decisions, derived from ideas set out in the Déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen. There was undoubtedly considerable unease in official circles in Britain as to how it would work. The Foreign Office said in a memo that to allow governments to become the object of such potentially vague charges by individuals is to invite communists, crooks, and cranks of every description to bring actions. But the clear awareness of the potentially dynamic nature of the convention didn't deter us from signing up. Indeed, we were the first country to ratify the convention in 1951. Lord McNair, a British legal scholar of renown, was the first president of the Court of Human Rights in 1959. And I think most importantly, the United Kingdom recognized the right of individual petition in 1966, with little argument to the contrary. Indeed, the principal advocate was Terence Higgins, a right of center conservative MP who supported it as he feared the curbs on freedom which a socialist government might introduce. And this, of course, more than anything else, has transformed the court from an international tribunal intended to deal with a very limited number of cases into the institution handling thousands of cases, which it is today. The examination of the work of the court since 1960 shows that its impact has been profound and beneficial. In its early years, it produced a series of landmark cases which have challenged and halted practices which were once considered acceptable in Western democracies, which would now be seen as entirely unacceptable by the vast majority of our public. Mark Ix in Belgium, 1979, the court ended state discrimination against children on the grounds of their illegitimacy. Ireland and the UK in 1978, it ruled that British interrogation techniques constituted inhuman and degrading treatment and practices. And I would add, these were in fact practices that were commonly being used by some other signatory states military forces at the time. Dudgeon in the United Kingdom, 1981, the court held that the criminalization of homosexual acts in private in Northern Ireland breached the convention, a decision with beneficial consequences far wider than for our country. Another case with widespread consequences concerned judicially sanctioned corporal punishment in the Isle of Man, which led to its total disappearance in all member states. What's striking, it seems to me, about these decisions is how well they've stood the test of time. In every example, Although they were in fact highly controversial at the time, the human rights norms which they express are now ones that we largely take for granted. And I think this is a key issue when one comes to consider one of the fundamental objections currently being raised against the ECHR by its domestic critics. 
It focuses on the complaint that the Convention is being interpreted as a living instrument in a manner that undermines the intention of its signatures. The implication, if taken to its logical conclusion, would be that the court should remain fixed in the moral and ethical standards of 1950. On that basis, none of the cases I've just cited would ever have been decided, as the matters complained of would have been considered acceptable at the time that the Convention was drawn up. Moreover, judicial interpretation to reflect current values isn't new and is rooted in a common law tradition and not just in an invention of Strasbourg. As Baroness Hale stated in her Grayson reading of 2011, it's in a comparatively rare case that an act of Parliament has to be construed and applied exactly as it would have been applied when it was first passed. Statutes are said to be always speaking and so must be made to apply to situations which would never have been contemplated when they were first passed. Thus, in 2001, a member of a family first used in 1920 could be held to include a same-sex partner. Today, in 1998, bodily harm in the statute of 1861 could now be held to include psychological harm. And in 2001, violence would be held to extend beyond physical violence into other sorts of violent behaviour. And she went on, in all these examples, the court is seeking to further the purpose of the legislation in the social world as it is now, rather than as it was when the statute was passed. This surely is exactly what the Strasbourg Court was doing as it developed its jurisprudence in the cases I've just identified. It's also what it's continued to do more recently. In Rantsev and Cyprus and Russia, in 2004, it held that trafficking fell within the definition of slavery in Article 4 and placed a positive obligation of the states to halt it. The same principle, of course, was applied in Essen Marpa in 2009 to identify that the blanket retention of DNA practiced in England and Wales, the only jurisdiction, I might add, in Europe to do this, was a breach of the right to a private and family life, even if the existence of DNA was entirely unknown in 1950. And I have to say, I've never heard a complaint against either of these decisions. The biggest change, however, to the operation of the Convention since the right of personal petition became general, has been the enlargement in the number of member states of the Council of Europe. At, as most have previously been governed by communist tyranny, the Convention and the Strasbourg Court has had to grapple with its consequential transformation from an international tribunal into a, a, sorry, from an international tribunal dealing with a limited, albeit growing, number of cases from countries in which the rule of law has become well established into a court of final resort for some 800 million people, many of them living in states where the principles underpinning the rule of law are often misunderstood, misapplied, or frankly, ignored. Yet for all the challenges this has created for the functioning of the court, to which I want to return a little later, the Convention has been of the greatest importance in helping promote the rule of law in environments where it's never previously existed. I just wanted to look at a few examples. I don't want to get involved in a lengthy list. I'm familiar that some of them will be very, fam I'm conscious that some of them will be very familiar to you, but others are largely unknown to the wider public. Campianu and Romania in 2008. The court held a violation of Article 2, where a young man abandoned as a child, HIV positive and mentally disabled, was transferred aged 18 from a centre for disabled children to a neuropsychiatric hospital, where he was found by a local NGO in an unheated room with bed with no bedding, dressed only in a pyjama top and with no assistance to eat or use the lavatory, and in fact he later died from the neglect. Mamadov in Azerbaijan in 2013. Opposition leader in that country published a blog post on a riot that contradicted the government's version of events. He was subsequently accused of inciting the riot in question, was imprisoned for seven years for endangering the lives of public officials. The court held that there had been breaches of Articles 5.1 as there was no basis for the reasonable suspicion required to justify his arrest and detention 
and of Article 5.4, as his claims as to the unreasonableness of his arrest have been dismissed without proper consideration. The court's judgment merely copied out the prosecutor's submissions on the matter. And of Article 6.2, in that the state had put out a press release indicating his guilt before he was even put on trial. Avulkina and Russia, the St. Petersburg local authority was found to have violated Article 8 in ordering all hospitals to disclose medical information on those who'd refused blood transfusions with the intention of rooting out Jehovah's Witnesses. It was held there'd been no pressing need for this disclosure of confidential medical information, no prior opportunity to object, no effort made to balance the right of ensuring public health with the privacy of the applicants. And that could go on. There are a series of cases ranging from beatings up and torture in Russian police stations in the context of a complaint system that doesn't work, Lyapin and Russia, Ukrainian local authority rendering the applicant's house uninhabitable and his land unusable by constructing and developing a cemetery that breached environmental health laws and where compensation was refused, Zemyuk and the Ukraine. These regrettably almost routine cases fill up the court's caseload. And I deliberately avoided cases such as Abu Zubaydah and al-Nashiri, where Poland was uh, said to have participated in holding terrorist suspects in secret prisons and torturing them after their unlawful rendition by the United States, or, or, uh, or further groundbreaking judgments such as Valianatos and Greece, where the Greek government was held in breach of Articles 8 and 14 in not including same-sex couples in their new civil union. And that's been followed by Oliari in Italy in July this year, where the court made a similar finding against Italy following three decades of failed efforts to give same-sex couples any legal recognition. Looking at just one country with a difficult human rights record, the extent and importance of the Convention's reach is readily apparent. In the case of Turkey, for example, it generated between 1959 and 2011 some 2,400 decisions against it, the largest number of any member state in that period. It was responsible for 43% of all cases that came before the court in alleging violations of Article 10 on freedom of expression. And that covers everything from the actions of the security forces against the PKK, the prosecution of an ex-prisoner for writing an article criticising prison conditions, demands for the wearing of headscarves at universities, the lack of any provision to recognise conscientious objections to military service, the expropriation of Greek Cypriot property in northern Cyprus, and the legitimacy of banning a political party. In all of these, the Strasbourg Court has, in the words of Asaf Kali, formerly a senior lecturer at UCL, provided a reasoned and authoritative statement about the boundaries between rights and the space for politics in Turkish domestic political discourse, and thus given leverage and resources for those fighting for the entrenchment of a human rights culture in the legal and political discourse of their countries. We can see the same thing in Russia, where despite the obstacles generated by those in authority, the continuing work of human rights groups in challenging the serious violations of human rights that have taken place in the North Caucasus has been empowered by the long list of cases on some of those violations brought before the Strasbourg Court. In July of this year, I had an opportunity of meeting with a public defender, who is in fact the Ombudsman of Georgia. And the thing which stuck in my mind, stood out in my mind, was how he emphasised to me that in the challenges he had to meet to promote the rule of law, the role of the court and of the Council of Europe in promoting compliance was crucial. Georgia had a long history of non-observance of domestic law by state authorities, and it was, he said, a very difficult legacy. But because the Georgian government was also committed to its membership of the Council of Europe and the status it brings, he found at the end of the day that it would respond and reform its practices where required. Without that backing, he told me, he believed that his work would be made much harder, if not completely impossible. One of the criticisms I most commonly hear in Britain of the working of the Convention, however, 
so in many cases the court's judgments are unobserved. This is used as a basis for arguing that the Convention's beneficial impact is waning and that it's ceasing to be of real value. The recent eighth report of the Council of Europe into the implementation of judgments certainly highlights serious problems. The number of cases where implementation has not been completed has for the last few years been stuck at around 11,000. It's certainly not going up anymore, but I have to say it's not coming down very far either. Not surprisingly, the source of the problem comes principally from the states that are breaching the Convention the most. Although in the worst case, Italy, it's principally linked to a vast number of repeat cases on the excessive length of judicial proceedings. But the other eight in descending order of non-implementation are Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Greece, Poland, Hungary and Bulgaria. In the case of Hungary, it reflects a serious deterioration in the current government's attitude to human rights abuses, much of which centre around cases involving discrimination against Roma. In Poland, the picture is rather one of steady and sustained improvement over its previous failings in respect uh, of uh, over lengthy periods of imprisonment on remand. For the remainder, the picture that emerges is one of systemic problems ranging through unlawful detentions of administrative acts violating privacy, non-enforcement of domestic judicial decisions, deaths and ill treatment in custody, and in Ukraine, issues of judicial impartiality. In Russia, there are serious uh, issues of discrimination against persons who are LGBT. The reports also highlight other states whose failures to respond to judgments may be numerically less significant, but are in relation to their size substantial. Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, where in fact the judgment in Mamadov has yet to be implemented, Bosnia, Serbia, Georgia, and Moldova. The contrast between most former communist states and the rest of the member states of the convention is therefore striking. Indeed, apart from Italy, there are no significant implementation issues concerning such states, apart, I regret to say, from ourselves, because of the failure to deal with Greens and MT over prisoner voting, and the problems we are still having in dealing with a substantial number of inquests arising from the troubles in Northern Ireland. This, I might add, is rather contrary to the myth which circulates around some elements of the press that states such as France ignore the consequences of adverse judgments of the court, or in the case of Italy, can, uh, in case of Germany, can disregard them if contrary to its constitution. Indeed, one recent example of the case is the case of M and Germany, where the constitutional court differed from the European court on the emotive issue of the legality of retrospectively imposed preventative detention. Despite a public outcry that dangerous criminals would be released, the court and the German government accepted the need to resolve the matter. France, too, has had to accept changes to the status of foreign birth certificates for children born from a surrogacy arrangement following the judgment in Menison. And as the Council of Europe report shows, despite long delays in some countries, compliance is generally eventually achieved. The average period for the states under scrutiny is just under, over four years, although for Russia it's closer to ten. That's far from satisfactory, but as an international treaty, its success is substantially dependent on peer group pressure for the implementation of judgments. As long as that pressure can be maintained and membership of the Council of Europe is seen as a benchmark of international respectability, then progress will be made. But if this doesn't happen, then the future of the Convention itself must be in jeopardy. And that brings me back to the United Kingdom government's present position. As I explained at the start, the government's announced a series of proposals that display considerable ambivalence to the value of the Convention. The original Conservative paper clearly implied withdrawal as it demanded a special status for us that it's inconceivable our fellow members of the Council of Europe could grant. Withdrawal is something that no democratic state has ever done. We would be following Greece under its military dictatorship in the 1960s. The government's position has now, however, become much more nuanced, with the Prime Minister stating on two occasions in Parliament 
that he doesn't want us to leave the Council of Europe or the Convention. But at the same time, the Justice Secretary, Michael Gove, has told the Justice Select Committee that he isn't 100% sure that the policy of scrapping the Human Rights Act will not lead to our withdrawal. The ambivalence isn't surprising. Criticism of the workings of the Strasbourg Court isn't confined to politicians. From Lord Hoffman in his speech to the Judicial Studies Board in 2009 and Lady Justice Arden's Thomas Moore <coughs> lecture of the same year, more recently, the views expressed by Lord Judge and Lord Sumption. There is a critique that has been made of the Strasbourg, the Strasbourg Court has failed at times to respect national differences of interpretation of the Convention, which should be allowed under the principle of subsidiarity, by which the primary responsibility for the observance of the Convention falls on national governments, courts and parliaments, and which is recognised by the margin of appreciation they have in doing this. It's also argued that the court's failing to appreciate sufficiently the practical limits of its authority if it gives judgments which contradict settled democratic will in areas where the margin of appreciation might be reasonably considered to apply. The problem originates in the understandable desire of the Strasbourg court to protect human rights in countries with poor records. As a result, it seems to me that it sometimes micromanaged the Convention too much. The problem caused by its decision on prisoner voting is a good illustration. The issue is one on which a strong policy case can be made for extending the vote to some prisoners. But an equally coherent case can be made for depriving them of it, as the court itself has acknowledged. The issue is largely symbolic but symbols matter in the context of parliamentary democracy. And the judgment was, in my opinion, an unnecessary interference with a policy that enjoys very high levels of parliamentary support in the United Kingdom. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get it fully reversed when I intervened in the case of Scopola and Italy in 2012 on the same point. But as a lawyer, I have to admit it isn't the first time I've disagreed with a court decision in which I have appeared. What's far more striking to me is prisoner voting apart, the complete paucity of concrete examples that are identifiable in the government's list of complaints against the way the Strasbourg Court is interpreting the Convention and the incoherence of its suggested solutions. Complaint is made that the way the Convention is being interpreted is allowing foreign nationals who've committed serious crimes in the United Kingdom to use qualified rights under Article 8 to remain here. It's this, along with proposals to reform the application of Article 3 on the prohibition of torture in deportation and extradition cases, which actually forms the heart of the proposals to differentiate the Bill of Rights interpretation of the Convention from that in the Human Rights Act. I don't have any difficulty agreeing that Article 8 is invoked irritatingly often to justify foreign criminals escaping deportation at the end of their sentences. But this has little to do with the Convention a lot more to do with our domestic courts and the failure of the UK Borders Act 2007 to address this issue as intended. That's why Parliament passed the Immigration Act 2014. It's intended to be compatible with the Convention. It makes clear within that framework Parliament's perception of what the public interest requires, namely that where a sentence of four years or more has been imposed, the public interest requires deportation unless there are very compelling circumstances over and above the cultural and family ties that are set out for, for foreign criminals sentenced to a lesser period of imprisonment. If it works, it's difficult to see how any proposed change to gloss the Convention text itself will actually make any difference, unless the intention is to create total incompatibility with its principles. There is a hint of this in the indication that a foreign national who I quote, takes the life of another, close quotes, will be excluded from invoking Article 8 altogether. But what taking a life means is simply not specified. Is it murder? Is it to include manslaughter, causing death by dangerous or even careless driving? Is it to apply to minors? And if it extends beyond just murder, how will it be applied to those whose offence is not held to merit even a custodial sentence, of whom there will clearly be a number? The same problem can be seen with a suggestion of tinkering with Article 3. The Conservative Party paper describes it as an inalienable right, but then suggests that the right should be qualified to alter the real risk test 
and replace it with another that would somehow make removal from the United Kingdom easier, but still be in line with, and I quote, our commitment to prevent torture and in keeping with the approach taken by other developed nations. Now at present, 47 of those developed nations accept or at least are supposed to accept the current interpretation of Article 3. So it's hard to see where this is going. Even the United States, which doesn't, is bound by the terms of the UN Convention Against Torture, which is one of the reasons why it can't return some Guantanamo detainees to their home countries. So either the proposed change will be of almost no effect, or if significant, it will undermine the key principle, not just of the Convention, but of one of our other international obligations. And finally, in his brief analysis of the government's criticisms, is its concern that the extension of the Convention to some of the activities of the UK overseas, and in particular, that of our armed forces. The suggested response is that any replacement Bill of Rights should be restricted in its operation to our own national territory. Now, as a former Attorney General, I'm well aware that the extension of the ECHR to the deaths or injury of our own servicemen abroad in an active service setting arising from the judgment of Smith and the MOD in our Supreme Court has caused considerable concerns. It's also clear that the overlap between international humanitarian law and the Convention lacks clarity, so that there is uncertainty as to when the ECHR will apply to the investigation of improper acts against enemy military or civilians. The development of Strasbourg jurisprudence has been criticised by lawyers for the International Red Cross as creating unhelpful complexity. But the principles of the standards of behaviour required of our own armed forces cannot be diminished by restricting the Convention territorially, even if it might deal with issues such as the legality of detention arising from cases such as Al Jeddah. Furthermore, the recent Strasbourg Court judgment in Hassan and the UK has clarified the law on the compatibility of detention under the Geneva Conventions with Article 5 of the Convention, and seems to me to provide a sensible point on which to build. So I'm very doubtful whether the simplistic solution of restricting the scope of the Convention territorially will resolve all the problems or in fact be necessary. The proposal also entirely fails to take into account the consequence for the citizens of other states if this change were ever to extend to all the signatory states of the Convention. It would mean that the many victims of serious human rights violations occurring outside the territory of the member state complained of would be left without redress. This would include, just taking some past examples, civilians who lost homes and property during the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Greek Cypriots suffering loss from the Turkish occupation of the north of Cyprus, and migrants intercepted at sea and returned to Libya by Italy, where they faced ill treatment. What is clear to me are the adverse consequences of these proposals. Some have suggested that these could be limited as creating incompatibility with the Convention and treating Strasbourg judgments thereafter as merely advisory would have few practical effects, even on our membership of the Council of Europe, which would be reluctant to lose our participation. I disagree. The issue is not our membership, but what our supported participation delivers in respect of our foreign policy goals. Precisely because the Convention is dependent on peer group pressure for its observance, we will offer an example and an invitation for it to be ignored by others. It's already the case that countries such as Russia and the Ukraine have used the United Kingdom position to procrastinate on implementing judgments. Others will do the same, and the Convention will be further challenged and undermined. Indeed, I think the impact will go further. Our current statements have already had an effect beyond the member states of the Convention. The United Kingdom position was used by Venezuela in justifying ignoring obligations under the American Convention on Human Rights, arising prior to its denunciation of it in 2013. The President of Kenya cited it at a time when the United Kingdom and other states were pressing him to cooperate with the International Criminal Court, of which Kenya accepts jurisdiction. 
And this is before one looks at the beneficial impact will be lost if the convention ceases to be viewed as a benchmark for citation in courts, something which happens quite commonly in countries like India and South Africa. Thus at a time when the United Kingdom rightly says it intends to continue to devote a substantial part of its foreign policy objectives to promoting human rights globally, something of which Beyond Borders is a direct beneficiary, and has been evidenced by our recent participation in the campaign against rape in war, at the same time we seem to be prepared to damage our ability to pursue that, those very goals. Yet compliance with the Convention has been shown to be effective in this regard. We need look no further than the classic bugbear for the tabloid press in Abu Qatada. By accepting the judgment of the Strasbourg court, rather than breaking the law by putting him on plane, the government was eventually still able to deport him, even if it delayed the process. But most importantly, it helped ensure reforms to the Jordanian criminal justice system, which were not only much needed, but overwhelmingly welcomed. Adherence to the principles of the Convention is explicit in our EU membership. At present, the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg is confined to applying the Convention as enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights only to matters within EU competence. But it's been expansive in this regard, as I've been very well aware when Attorney General, and it's been a goal of government policy to restrict this trend. I have to say I can think of nothing more likely to accelerate it than claims being brought before the European Court of Justice by persons claiming they can get no redress domestically or through the Strasbourg Court for a violation of the Convention. And of course, any judgment of the European Court of Justice against the United Kingdom would then have direct effect here. Domestically, non-compliance with the Convention calls into question the devolution settlements for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland which enshrine convention rights as governing all their actions. Parliament at Westminster could, of course, legislate to change the position, but there is pretty overwhelming evidence this would be against the will of the devolved administrations. In the case of Northern Ireland, it's also part of an international treaty involving the Irish government. At a time when the peace settlement in Northern Ireland is still fragile, and the future of the United Kingdom itself is in question, it opens up the prospect of new areas of political discord. Now, while I appreciate that maybe some, including, of course, in this audience, who might welcome this as hastening their domestic political goals, I do this find this a very odd thing for a government committed to the Union to do. And rather oddly in this debate on the Convention's failure, the government seems to me to entirely underestimate or ignore how well placed we are to influence the Convention's development. When the United Kingdom held the presidency of the Council in 2012, I worked with Ken Clark as Lord Chancellor to build a consensus for reform among the 47 signatory states, which built on the work of previous UK governments. The result was the Brighton Declaration, it sought to address the backlog of cases, the quality of judicial appointments and got the principles of subsidiarity and the margin of appreciation into the preamble to the Convention, so as to guide the court towards avoiding the type of decisions we saw in Hearst. I think we could have achieved much more and actually changed the text of the Convention itself if our fellow signatory governments who shared our analysis and our goals had not been deterred by their own domestic NGOs from full cooperation with our agenda. And that was because of a fear that we wished to diminish and not improve the court's effectiveness. That fear was misplaced, but in the circumstances that have followed, entirely understandable. Three years after Brighton, there are plenty of signs that reform is working. The backlog of cases is being addressed, it's down from a peak of nearly 150,000 to 63,800 on the 30th of June this year. The system for early assessment of merit has led to many cases being filtered out more rapidly. 99.9% .9 of the cases brought against the United Kingdom in 2013 were struck out as inadmissible. There has, as we've seen, been some progress on implementation. There needs to be more. But seeing the Prime Minister specifically emphasise the importance of this in his speech to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe during our presidency, it would help a bit if we did some leading by example. 
The Council of Europe, unlike the EU, has always viewed the United Kingdom as one of its key champions. Coming as we do from a 200-year tradition of creating, deepening, and observing international obligations to make the world a safer and better place, I once asked the Foreign Office how many international treaties we were committed to. They refused to go back before 1834, but their calculation was 13,200 <laughs> treaties had been signed by the United Kingdom since then. So that tradition, in view of that tradition, our commitment is not surprising. We're in an excellent position to continue this work if we're willing to move away from a destructive measure and destructive rhetoric. The importance of our role is not confined to the government. It's the entire tradition of judicial independence and high quality jurisprudence. The important shift by our own national courts away from the principles in Ulla, defining the requirement to take account of as being the close mirroring of Strasbourg decisions, has initiated a dialogue that's led to a number of cases to, to the Strasbourg court, in the Strasbourg court showing deference to our own. We can see this in the way the court moved from a condemnation by a chamber of the court of our rules on hearsay in Al Khawaja in 2009 to the acceptance of the Supreme Court decision when the Grand Chamber reviewed, revisited the case in 2011, following the rejection of its previous decision by the Supreme Court in Horncastle. Recent decisions such as the Animal Defenders case on political advertising and its potential infringement of Article 10 on freedom of expression reinforce the view that well-reasoned interpretations by our own senior courts of convention rights are unlikely to be rejected. Moreover, a key factor in the Strasbourg Court's decision in the Animal Defenders case was that the matter had been thoroughly considered by our own Parliament. In pressing for a wholesale reform of our relationship with the Convention and the Court, the government seems to me to be in danger of fighting yesterday's battle. The government stated it will publish a detailed consultation paper on its ideas for a Bill of Rights and our future relations with the Convention this autumn. I'd like to say how very much I welcome this. For the reasons I've tried to set out tonight, I rather suspect that in doing so, it will have to accept the overwhelming evidence that the Convention, when viewed in its totality, has been and remains today a success. Arguably, the single most important legal and political instrument for promoting human rights on our planet. It's also conceded that the text of the Convention sets out rights it wishes to see protected. For those of us who want to preserve and enhance our country's role in supporting the Convention, there's therefore a great opportunity. <coughs> we need to repeatedly ask how any proposal that's put forward will in practice deliver benefits which outweigh the obvious cost to our influence, reputation and national interest in reducing Convention rights domestically and thus violating the terms of our adherence to it with all the consequences that flow from it. When the froth of the political, the political polemic is removed, there can only be one answer to this question. This is why I remain convinced that if this matter is debated with determination and good humour, we will get that right answer at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Drafted for 
legislative purposes by the Crown Council who draft our normal legislation, because there's a total absence of definition. Uh, the word family is not defined. Democracy is not defined. There are many versions of democracy. Reasonableness is not, of course, defined. And when you go right through the whole uh, convention and find that this to be so, the result inevitably is that somebody has to define these words. And the body charged with that responsibility is a body of judges. Now these judges uh, have weaknesses. There are some excellent judges. <clears throat> some of them come from a common law tradition where the judges have a tremendous degree of independence and exercise it. <clears throat> Most of them come from a continental tradition where the judges are salaried and often lack independence. And sadly, in the court, we've seen instances of judges who lack competence as well as independence. So what has happened is there's been a transfer of the definition of the law from elected parliaments, like our own, to unelected judges in a convention which it is extremely difficult to alter for reasons that uh, Dominic uh, has uh, touched upon. And it, it does worry me deeply that this is so. However, <clears throat> I'm fortified by uh, his recognition, and uh, I myself spoke about it in the House of Lords two or three years ago, of the fact that now judges are following the lead of Lord Hoffman uh, and others to say we must not accept what Strasbourg says as if it were gospel. That was a rule laid down by among others, I'm afraid, <coughs> by Lord Roger of Ells Ferry, who said once Strasbourg has spoken, the question is finished. That is not what the Human Rights Act said, and the judges are coming around to interpret it properly. So one other thing I'd like to just to say, <clears throat> I've been to a number of the countries that were mentioned by the Dominic Grieve. One of them was Georgia. I asked the Chief Justice <clears throat> if I could visit some of his inferior courts, and he chose one which he thought was a good one because it had been financed with German money. So I was taken out to the court and met all the judges and so on. The judges, by the way, were being paid less than $200 a month, which uh, cast a question over their independence because they had BMWs and Lexuses in the uh, car park outside. <clears throat> but uh, I went around, and what struck me very forcibly as we went from court to court, that there was not a book to be seen. So I did ask, and this was about eight years ago, I asked, could they show me please a copy of the European Convention on Human Rights? They couldn't. They hadn't seen it. They knew nothing about it at all. So there's an immense gulf between the way we treat the Convention and the way these other countries do. And that's somehow got to be addressed. And the final point I want to make is, when you look at countries like Russia, and Azerbaijan, uh, countries which virtually ignore the convention and don't implement the judgments. Contrast them with Moldova, I'm happy to say, where one of the John Smith fellows led the first two cases that were taken uh, to Strasbourg, overturning decisions of the Moldovan courts. But when you look at the ones that ignore it, we allow them to remain <coughs> full members of the European, uh, of the Council of Europe. There's something wrong with the imbalance that we've got, and that is partly at the heart of all the worries that have been expressed. Well, well I, 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 I agree with all that, uh, and I hope in my talk I made clear that um, I certainly don't think that the Convention is a perfect instrument. Um, it's full of imperfections, and certainly its interpretation is open to quite widespread variations. And there's clearly a very big difference between countries with a long jurisprudential tradition and countries which don't have it. There are arguments for having a British Bill of Rights. Um, it was obviously one of the things in contemplation in the 1990s when, before incorporation took place, there was a commission set up by the Labour Party to discuss it. It rather foundered because nobody could agree what other rights they wanted to put in this document, 
particularly socio-economic rights, which is why I think they plumped for the rather minimalist approach of incorporating the convention and asking our own judges to interpret it. But there is the sort of irony, as I was pointing out, that perhaps for domestic reasons connected to devolution, the government has concretely announced that the convention text is going to be the foundation of the British Bill of Rights. So logically, the interpretation Admittedly, they want to gloss the text in ways which I've explained. But the likelihood is that in 90, even if they went ahead with their plans, I would myself have thought that in probably 98%, perhaps more of the cases that came before our own domestic court, the outcome to the questions is likely to be exactly the same in future as it is today. The damage is to whether we want to try to continue improving standards elsewhere within the Council of Europe states. It's a sort of cost-benefit analysis, which is the classic problem which politicians have to wrestle with. That's why I agree with you that I think the best thing that's happened is the much greater willingness of our own courts to engage in that dialogue with Strasbourg. And indeed, I think that other countries' courts are doing the same thing. And it's always been made clear to me every time I've been to Strasbourg that decisions of our own Supreme Court are given a very high measure of respect. And I, 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 I think that it's, we are, in that sense, able to make a powerful contribution. But that contribution starts to diminish when we are acting as a destabilizing influence to an international treaty, which seems to me to be rather important. And as I say, it's also so contrary to our national tradition on international obligations. There are lots of other international obligations which we are subject to, which prove irksome. And as Attorney General, I had to go and argue a matter on the law of the sea uh, in an arbitration in Istanbul, where I don't think the outcome entirely pleased Her Majesty's government, uh, but we're signatories to this treaty. We never suggested we're not going to observe its terms. It was over the British Indian Ocean Territory. And so I just think we have to be realistic about what it is in our national interest to do. And in those circumstances, have to be accepting that there are mechanisms to pursuing our goals which are not perfect and this one clearly isn't perfect and indeed i wish we'd improved it more in the brighton declaration and there may come a time when we can do more still in changing the way the court works and in some of the definitions um, so this i have to admit this the dialogue that's taken place i think over the last five or six years particularly on the back of hearst and the United Kingdom's Parliament digging its heels in has probably not, well, I believe it has the capacity to be very constructive. But if we take it to its logical end where the government seems to want to go, I think it will end up being destructive and deliver very few benefits. Yes. Would you, Christine, would you identify yourself? Uh, Christine Bell. Um and I suppose a long time campaigner for a human rights act in Northern Ireland as former head of the committee on the administration of justice. Um, I really enjoyed the lecture, I thought it was excellent, so thank you very much. I suppose in ways one of the important questions at the end of it is really how many friends you have um, uh, and the exact numbers. Um, I don't know if you care to comment on that. Um, but I suppose maybe another question is really that uh, if there is a fair and reasonable debate, um, you know, really the arguments you've set out, I think, have a large common sense appeal. And it's hard to see any of the um, ways that the convention could be tweaked really having any effect without severing the relationship to the appellate juris sort of quasi-appellate jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so I wonder, but given that the documents to date were really, in a way, legally illiterate, a lot of the things they said they wanted to do are, were already, are already achieved by the Human Rights Act, and there was an ignorance of devolution, and, in, and, and there's been a level of dishonesty also to the debate and to the documentation. Uh, it seems to me that really where we are at, worryingly perhaps, is that the symbolic value of doing something that seemed to um, repeal or replace while achieving very little in practice is almost outweighing uh, any type of sort of reasoned argument as to what that might be. I appreciate that you're doing what you can on the other side, but how confident are you 
that there will be a fair and reasonable debate and capacity to have that in the current climate? I think there is the capacity to have a fair and reasonable debate. Obviously, the arithmetic of all this in parliamentary terms is very difficult to identify. To begin with, at the moment, I don't know what the proposals are that the government is going to bring in. My understanding is they remain intent on producing a consultation paper during the course of the autumn. And if I've understood my colleagues in government, uh, they are also intent on legislating in the 2016-17 parliamentary session. That said, uh, it has been noteworthy since the original proposals were brought out last October that there does seem to have been a certain amount of rowing back. If you recollect, there was supposed to be a detailed Conservative Party draft bill that was going to be published in the early part of this year before the general election. And it never saw the light of day. Um, I've never seen it, I should make this quite clear. I don't know what happened to it, but it was dropped. And in fact, the promises made, which were essentially repetition of the October paper, sort of, I can't remember which page it's on in the Conservative Party manifesto, but I seem to remember it's about page 93. It's not exactly given a great deal of prominence. One story I did hear, I'm quite happy to repeat, I think I've got it on good authority, is there was quite a lot of private polling done by my party before the general election, very sensibly, I'm sure all political parties did it, about what matters to the electorate. And my understanding is that when asked the question, does reform of human rights and scrapping the Human Rights Act matter to you, um, the sensational figure of 16% of the people polled thought this was a priority which suggests to me that, as we so often see in the United Kingdom, issues can rise in salience, particularly on the back of a particular episode such as Abu Qatada or Abu Hamza. But once they've floated off the radar screen, people are not particularly exercised by that. They may be exercised about the economy and all sorts of other things, but this is not their principal interest. And I think that's one of the reasons why it didn't get beyond page 93 of the manifesto. So I think there may be an awareness of some of my colleagues in government that this isn't the stupendous issue which the Daily Mail would like to suggest it is, or for that matter, the Telegraph. When it comes to the arithmetic, it's difficult to know because politicians and parliamentary colleagues tend to be loyal. Um, rebelling on an issue that comes before parliament is something which you do very reluctantly and it depends on what is being presented and it depends on whether there's an attempt at compromise. Um, all I can say is I think at the moment the government would have very great difficulty enacting the proposals it's set out in the past and getting them through Parliament. That's the House of Commons, leave the House of Lords out of it. I have my doubts that there is a majority for it and I think there are enough Conservatives who are sufficiently concerned about this uh, who would not wish to see our position in the Council of Europe endangered. So the question is what the government then comes up with. The difficulty that I can foresee is that this is a subject which has been talked up over the years quite consistently and as I make the point, it's not just confined to the Conservative Party, the silence from other political parties at difficult moments has often been very notable. Um, so because it's been talked up it's going to be rather difficult to talk down. The risk is if we end up with a cosmetic solution, simply changing the words Human Rights Act to British Bill of Rights, then somebody will come along and say, well, it hasn't delivered what's on the ticket because what people imagine is it's suddenly going to enable us to deport people to nasty places. It isn't. Even if the government enacts what it's proposing, that isn't really going to happen. I would be staggered if any such case ever got past our judiciary applying the convention principles embodied in a Bill of Rights, even if there was an attempt to gloss it. So the problem is going to be, <coughs> I think, a wider exercise in persuasion, which is why I've been banging on about this for the last 12 months, to try to persuade people to just see sense about this. And if we can get the climate right, then I think it provides the government with an opportunity to make a sensible and reasoned approach to this. And what that will be, whether it's backing off entirely or what they produce, I don't know. But it strikes me that we just need to continue debating it. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 Ye
just like to contribute to the debate. Yes. Uh, Charles Livingston and Brody, just building on that last point about um, public buy-in and enthusiasm for the Convention and the Human Rights Act. Um, sort of putting this to you slightly as devil's advocate, but one of the challenges that has been put to the Convention and the Human Rights Act, not by the government, but actually more from, I've seen from left-wing and sort of libertarian commentators, is not that the Convention goes too far in protecting some rights, but that it doesn't go far enough in protecting others, and in particular the sort of common law liberties that you noted as people having taken for granted. And I think um, a lot of that has been focused on freedom of speech and the fact that over the last, almost since the Human Rights Act was brought in, there have in some respects been curtailments of that that have led to you know people being investigated and prosecuted for poor taste jokes on Twitter and things like that. Um, so two questions. Um, What's your view on that argument? Um, and as a sort of follow-up, might there be scope for something like a British Bill of Rights to make improvements in areas where the Convention is lacking, and by enhancing the protection of those more traditional rights, perhaps improve the public's willingness to accept the trade-off of sometimes ne'er-do-wells having uh, other rights respected uh, in ways that traditionally they might not have? Yes, it brings them on to a sort of delicate area. Um, I think the debate over human rights can't just be viewed in isolation. One of the reasons why it creates the response it does within Parliament, and one of the reasons why we never move towards a wider Bill of Rights, protecting other rights that we might regard as being important, I think comes from a crisis taking place in our political system about the sovereignty of Parliament. And of course it's a very acute topic, particularly in the context of devolution and indeed potentially Scottish independence. Uh, uh, the more I've thought about this, the more it seems to me to be quite clear that we are moving in a world where the system of governance, which we have more generally, and have had for a long time because we have an unwritten constitution, seems to me to be becoming less and less able to respond to some of the pressures upon it. And the hostile reaction which you get at Westminster to what is seen as a progressive undermining of authority is not just about the Human Rights Act, but it's also about the whole way in which authority within the state actually operates. If we were to envisage a substantial change in our arrangements, then I can readily see that um, a new United Kingdom emerging from it with devolution rights clearly defined in a rather different, and actually it would have to be in a written constitutional context, could undoubtedly merit from having a Bill of Rights underpinning it that goes much further than the Human Rights Act and I think could potentially command widespread public support. But that's an issue which is very difficult to tackle because as matters stand at the moment at Westminster, it's envisaging, you can call it evolutionary, but it's envisaging a really major change in our arrangements. I'm going to give a talk about this in a couple of weeks' time. I've been sort of thinking about it over the summer. And it's areas in which on the whole politicians don't want to go. Um, I happen to think that realistically, at some point in the next five to ten years, if the Union of the United Kingdom is sustained and we wish to sustain it, we are going to have to address this issue. Because at the moment, the wider issue generates a large amount of distrust. You can see it at the moment, for example, at Westminster, over the sort of strange debate we've got over English votes for English laws and the powers which we're further devolving to Scotland. There's a breakdown in trust about what's intended. The Human Rights Act is actually a component part of it, and of course one of the reasons why the devolved administrations are so keen on retaining it is because it's part of that dialogue, that debate that's going on. So yes, I think there is the potential to do something different, but if we're going to go down that road, there has to be a political willingness to embrace a change, which might actually turn out hugely beneficial in both maintaining the United Kingdom, making the different component parts comfortable with their 
separate legislatures and powers and provide a, a way to the future. Other common law jurisdictions have done it. Uh, but in the meantime, it's a difficult topic to start to address. And I would be, you're right, it's, it's a legitimate subject of debate, but at the moment, I, my, I think I've got to concentrate on priorities. And the first priority strikes me is making sure that the United Kingdom government doesn't do something which I fear it may regret if it goes ahead and in fact uncouples us from the convention. Invite any other comments? Yes. Jim Gallagher, Dominic, I'm, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole of territorial constitutions because <laughs> we'll be here all night. But can I go back to the convention? You said, I think rightly, uh, that the government's having last year's argument from last decade's argument. I think the interesting question is what's going to be next year's argument. A striking thing about the problems of the convention is it's all to do with foreigners. Okay, those, those are the people we don't like. Uh, and we're not absolutely convinced they're human, I suspect. Uh, certainly they don't get human rights. But uh, the big thing that's going to happen over the next decade is migration. Uh, we are going to see orders of magnitude a uh, difference uh, in the pressure of migration in Europe. What effect is that going to have on the Convention and the state's willingness to obtemper it uh, for those humans uh, who are not currently Europeans? I think it's a, a very serious issue. I think migration is probably the single biggest challenge that's faced, of the scale we have, is the biggest challenge facing Europe since the end of the Second World War. It has the capacity to destroy the working of the EU. Forget about the UK and its referendum. I can see the EU disintegrating under the pressures that it brings. You can already see some of the signs in the disagreements between Germany and Hungary or other member states. Um, and clearly, if the United Kingdom leads the way in some way in suggesting that rights are not universal and can be confined to your own citizens, for example, which isn't quite in fairness what the government takes there, but the practical application of some of the government's proposals hints at, and it's certainly what the Daily Mail would like, then I think that sends out a very bad signal at a time when the universality of rights, I think, needs to be clearly reinforced. Um, this is a crisis, I have no doubt about it, and I think one can sense it at Westminster, and I feel it. Um, we're going to need a lot of common sense if we are going to get ourselves through it. Uh, and of course, as I have a feeling that migration levels are in practical terms very hard to control unless you want to resort to draconian acts of violence against people to keep them out, which I think and hope is unlikely, then having a rights-based system, which everybody clearly understands, including the people who are coming in, is going to be all the more important if we are to absorb incomers in the scale, the scale that they're arriving and succeed in maintaining a civil society of the kind we've inherited from our forebears and want to hand on to our children. So for all those reasons, I think it's particularly important that we should be seen to be operating within the convention system because of its importance. Um, but that's not to say we can't have a debate on trying to improve it, but I do feel that it is important. Any, any other comments? Yes. Okay, Springham Advocate. Can I ask perhaps a, a rather prosaic question? Some of the previous questions have touched upon the public perception of the European Convention on Human Rights and the way in which it is presented in the media. Does that matter? Does it matter how it's represented and misrepresented in the media? Does it matter if the public have a misunderstanding of the Convention? And if it does matter, what if anything can be done about it? It does matter because, as I know as a politician, um, if, if you go along to certainly a, a, a meeting, usually of members of my own party and an association, 
Um, or if you listen to the Conservative Party conference, if the moment the word human rights is sort of mentioned in a negative way, there's a round of applause. Yet, oddly enough, if you actually stand up at a meeting and explain what it's all about, um, you get a totally different response. Well, I've noticed this throughout my time in politics. And I've survived as a politician, despite the fact that members of my political association in Beaconsfield, their instinctive reaction is probably derived from reading the Daily Mail in many cases. And so they are infuriated at what they see as rights abuses. It's not they don't believe in human rights. It's that they believe that human rights are being systematically abused and being given to undeserving people, that it costs them a lot of money, and it makes the operation of government impossible and the protection of the law-abiding citizens much more difficult. Now, it's true it costs money, as you can't determine rights a priori, they tend to have to be litigated, so I have to make it accept that it contributes to litigation. But actually, does it make government impossible? Well, in my four years and two months as Attorney General, I never thought it made government impossible. Of course, it caused frustration to my colleagues and understandable frustration at times. But then lots of things cause frustration to those in government. It's our allotted life. You know? So um, I think it does matter because it sets up a mood music in the background. And politicians, for perfectly legitimate reasons in a democratic society, you also want to try to appeal to their electorate. So actually going out and challenging the received wisdom that is coming down that people have is not an easy thing for politicians to do, particularly if they think the audience is likely to support them on other things. It's very rare in a democracy for politicians to go out and tell audiences with prejudices, uh, which they think might be favourable to supporting them, that in fact they're prejudiced in a way that is undesirable. It doesn't normally happen with any political party. And as I've noticed, as I say, over prisoner voting, the silence from Edinburgh uh, over prisoner voting when we debated it was very interesting. I did gently point this out to Alex Salmond when we were debating in Parliament and he didn't really answer my point. So you know, at the end of the day, that's what democracy is about. It's very messy. Uh, so I think it does matter. Uh, and, of course, one of the problems is that having enacted the Human Rights Act, I hope I'm not being overly critical of Labour, but Labour sort of enacted it and then almost apologised about it and forgot about it. And I think we failed, really, to explain it in a way that put out the positives. So it started to be viewed as a negative. But as I say, the recent polling rather suggests to me that it may be much less negative than some people imagine, uh, because most people are not going to be deeply troubled about this one way or the other, unless they think it's leading to some result that is spectacularly unfair. Any other comments? Looks like it though. Amanda, Amanda, thank you. I'm very grateful for the platform, literally. <laughs> As chair of the International Committee of the Bar Council of England and Wales, and echoing what Dominic said in his opening remarks, I too am particularly delighted at the many opportunities I have to work with and learn from lawyers and legal academics from overseas, as exemplified by this evening's lecture. We are delighted at the Bar Council to co-host with the Faculty of Advocates this Rule of Law lecture, now an annual event. It demonstrates both our organisation's interest in and commitment, not just to the domestic practice of law in our daily lives, but to the greater and more complex subject of the rule of law more globally. I would like to thank Dominic for sharing his views on the European Convention, uh, reminding us that human rights and indeed statutory interpretation is a living dynamic organism flexible to cope with extensions of scientific knowledge and changes in the mores of society. You've made us recall the basic day-to-day -day areas of life on which the Convention has had real and positive effect, uh, in particular for those who may be most vulnerable. It's perhaps an unintended consequence of our potential farewell to the ECHR 
that will have a negative effect on the world more widely. In my view, this exit is something that not only impacts on the rule of law globally, but will undermine our own country's position, not just in terms of rule of law, but our relations in trade and otherwise. May I thank James Wolfe and the Faculty of Advocates for encouraging and nurturing the relationship between the Bar Council and the Faculty, uh, and uh, Beyond Borders for facilitating this lecture and for its work in extending the rule of law and human rights training in a very practical effect in many places around the globe, with the help of our advocates and judges. Uh, and finally again, Dominic, once more, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture and your most in generous engagement in the debate and the questions which followed. Thank you very much.